Okay, for this video, I want to help you turn the corner uh, as you start looking at the readings uh, a bit more closely. And we're, I'm going to introduce you to this concept called exegesis, which uh, has a really ancient history, uh, but has kind of reappeared as a method uh, over and over and over again throughout uh, human civilization. Um, and we're going to try to make that make sense to the concept of legality, uh, which is more complicated than uh, a single definition of law. Uh, and I'm kind of playing with this idea of what I thought I knew you knew, right? Meaning I'm going to have a self-reflective process uh, based on my exegesis of student work uh, over the last uh, 13 years. Um, so one of these things that I just, you know, I thought the students knew that I, I probably should have examined myself was this idea of close reading, that someone at some point had taught you uh, how to do close reading. Um, when I reflect upon this, I don't have a good reason for why I thought that. Um, and so what it is, is it's, it means that you're going to look for the critical perspective to find meaning within a larger context. Uh, and so this means that for the examples for this week's reading, for example, uh, that you'd want to learn more about the Raven and, and Oprah uh, interchange, which means you'd want to learn more about Raven and Oprah themselves, right? You want to learn who these people are. Uh, even if you've heard of them, uh, you'd want to learn more about them in this particular context. Um, why is Oprah trying to label Raven and why is Lab R Raven resisting and, and what's the fallout from that? Um, and you'd want to learn more about that structure, more about those relationships. Um, and then, you know, I think for the example of Robert Maplethorpe, right, uh, an artist who was accused of lewd or criminal content through their art, uh, you'd want to compare, you know, how have things changed and how have they stayed the same um, with a situation like looking at Kim Kardashian, uh, South Park, or the situation with Two Live Crew. In other words, you wouldn't just read the case about Robert Maplethorpe, you try to put it into a larger concept of, of what is considered lewd, who gets to decide that, uh, and then what are the arguments that people make. Um, for why something is obscene and should be criminal, right? Why a piece of art should be criminalized, whereas, you know, uh, and I'll point out in this particular example is that we, we tend to criminalize uh, gay art, uh, whereas we don't tend to criminalize naked women, right, who are obviously meet the definition of obscene, but then we don't tend to prosecute those women. Um, and in the case of South Park, things that are much more obscene and much more lewd than Robert Mapplethorpe's work, again, but it's it's you know, two straight individuals. And so social factors have a lot to do with how we criminalize behavior uh, in actuality. And then, you know, in the reading about Ozma, uh, you've got this young woman who's uh, voicing uh, for protest and for participation among young people and students. Uh, and if you, I would, you know, in this situation, close reading would you wanting to learn more about the Cairo, the Cairo uprising uh, and the revolution in Egypt, uh, and you'd want to look at other democracy uh, revolutions and try to think about, you know, why is it that in other countries and at different times, uh, even in this country, students have been relatively powerful uh, when they join together, but in this moment in time, uh, students aren't using their power uh, to fight for their rights, right? So tuition goes up every year, loans get more dramatic, and students just take it, right? They don't, they don't rise up and try to change the system. Uh, whereas in other countries, people wish w with much less power and a lot less money and a lot less influence and sometimes not even places to live, uh, they're working together to overcome injustice. And so you want to think about that, right? It's not judgment of individuals trying to, why does one system promote resistance and the other one shuts it down? And then you want to think about Najla Saeed and how she's deconstructing her own identity uh, and really identities. And then you want to think about things that we have in this country, like the U.S. Census or your FAFSA form, and why do we label people uh, with particular identities that don't really make sense to them and really don't make any logical sense either. Uh, and then finally, you want to think about why does a minority elite, uh, Justice Sotomayor, why is, why is she telling you that you have to work harder, uh, but that same logic doesn't apply to somebody like me, um, who is a white male uh, of Anglo-Saxon heritage, right? So how come not everyone has to work equally hard when we say we believe in a fair system. And so basically, you know, what I thought you knew would be that, you know, you're not just reading one reading for the main point, you're trying to put it and weave it together into a larger structure.
And the reason for these particular readings is that they're helping you see a context uh, that shows you that law is experienced differently by different people uh, at different times throughout the system. And so this really starts to help you develop a dialogue of multiple ways of thinking. And so then this gets to the idea of dialogue and meaning is that works, words don't speak for themselves. And so right, context is necessary for people to interpret what that word means. And that means they're going to interpret it based on their own experiences and based on their own position or their point of view. Uh, just like this picture with the elephant. It's really about what you're looking at and what you think things mean. That's what you're going to see and that's how you're going to interpret. And so a dialogue would form when you start talking to other people and you get a larger picture of the elephant uh, based on each person's positionality. And this really has to come down to whether one admits they're biased or not. Right? Lots of people want to think they're not biased when that's impossible. Uh, because you don't see everything, you don't know everything, right? So we only have our own point of view and that's based on our experiences and things we've been taught and things we've thought about it. And so once we admit our implicit bias, it's a whole lot easier to then engage in dialogue with people from, from different backgrounds. Uh, if you don't admit it, then it becomes you know, nearly impossible uh, to have any exchange of, of reasonable information. It's also important then to notice that just it, it's not just individuals that are biased, right? It's that the system produces those biases. And so it's mobilized power against the powerless, and that's the systemic bias. And so learning requires us to be able to make associations. You have to be able to think about the different parts of the elephant, the different parts of society, the different parts of an issue, uh, and associate those with examples from your own life and things you've thought about or things that you've heard. So the end goal for a class like this, I pulled this from a student, I'm working on a paper and, and I was looking at some student responses and I think this really was a good example of what, you know, what you're trying to do in this class. Um, and it really builds up the idea that your experiences are knowledge and that textbook learning often refers to an object but it never actually engages with that object. So a kind of good example that came from a class the other day was, you know, a book that, or a, a professor that talks about stars but then you actually never go to space, right? And so life is really a collection of experiences about how things uh, really are is more valuable than this like idea of stars that comes from a book but doesn't have any uh, actual practical application. So I'll give you a few seconds to read this uh, to the right here so you can think about it. And so I think when the student is, you know, giving an example here of a concept that they were dealing with, racial discrimination, that they now could see from their everyday experience, and they shared a lot of stories with me throughout the class, uh, of their ability to now apply what discrimination looks like at the systemic level, as opposed to thinking about it in individual terms. Uh, and then they use, um, you know, clear examples of how that applies to other uh, ethnic groups uh, aside from African Americans and so they're starting to see this kind of larger prejudice uh, through the system and how that's based in cultural dominance and then they kind of connect that at the end to how the criminal justice system then uses this mobilized bias against particular people and how that affects the whole system together and so it's a really good um, way of letting you know that this is something the student came to at the end of the semester right that this isn't something they got from week four uh, it's that putting the pieces together, they then got to this systemic view. So I then wanted to give you, just end with an a example here um, that I've been thinking about recently. Um, a, a friend of mine, a criminal justice professor, uh, came up with um, this claim that other, that other uh, uh, scholars have claimed, which is that a process like uh, summary judgment um, is unconstitutional because it wasn't explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. And this comes up quite a bit, right? A judge will say, well, you don't have the right to reproductive health because it wasn't in the Constitution. Um, and I'm sure that there's a certain level of socio-political sense to this, right? If people believe what they believe, they have their political opinions, and those are based on some form of thinking. But in a legal class, right, I'm, I'm challenged here because I can't just let that statement be stated as if it were only true. Uh, the problem is that it's an erroneous conclusion if you're looking at it from formal legal reasoning. And 
formal legal reasoning requires uh, that we look at contradictions like this, uh, whether you have rights or not, whether it's in the Constitution or not, by arguing in cases like or unlike previous cases. So we wouldn't use political arguments, we'd use legal arguments from cases. Uh, and that doesn't make it better or worse, it just, right, it's the challenge of looking at things from a legal uh, system. And so, you know, if, if I take, when I hear something like that, summary judgment uh, isn't constitutional, part of me wants to say, yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, but part of me also says, well, but on the other hand, lots of judges have said it's constitutional for hundreds of years. And so politically, maybe I'd like it to be uh, unconstitutional or even immoral. Uh, but legally speaking, I have to think about how am I going to frame my argument by arguing against those cases, right? I have to say basically that all of these judges have been wrong for these you know, several hundred years. So I have to have exegesis. I'm gonna have to have a very close reading of these cases uh, of the Constitution, of the notes from the Constitution. I'm gonna have to put together a very clear argument uh, that provides a context for this claim. I can't just generalize and say, I believe this is unconstitutional. Um, and so part of that, I'm, I'm obviously not going to do the whole thing here, but part of that would be like, okay, this, seem, this sounds like the person is saying, well, the judges shouldn't have this right to get rid of a case uh, because um, the Constitution says that everyone is entitled to a jury trial. And so they interpret that to be everybody should actually have, you know, start to finish a jury going over every detail of every possible claim that the person might come up with. Um, so the first problem I have with this is that, well, that's fine, right? That can be a political position. And if Congress uh, or democracy, right, the legislative branch passes a law that protects that process, then, then you know, that would be democratic. But Congress has done the opposite of that, that they gave that power explicitly to the courts to decide their own rules of cases. And so the rule that's being applied here in a summary judgment case is that the judge is ruling based on whether any evidence has been put forward of the claim that the person is making. And if they haven't put, support, uh, put forth sufficient evidence, then the judge dismisses the case. And, you know, from my own experience, you know, lawyers are given a lot of leeway to kind of speculate about what evidence they think they might get through this process called discovery. And so if you bring a case and you have no evidence and you have not said where you're going to get the evidence, it seems hard to defend that position from a purely uh, legal caseload uh, point of view saying that you should have your day in court when when you don't have any evidence for the claim you're making and all you're saying is that you can convince a jury that you're right uh, it's arguing then that the system the legal system should not use evidence at all right it should be purely based on rhetoric it should just be based on your ability to argue again if the people decide that and the legislature passes that rule then perhaps courts would respond to that but the opposite has happened in reality. In, in 1934, the Congress has given this process to the court to come up with their own rules of procedure, and, and you could read all of the reasons why Congress wanted to do that. And so w what you see now is just by complicating this through a close reading uh, and through the use of history is that we're actually talking about big philosophical questions about the nature and purpose of courts uh, in a society like ours and really how you know judicial decision making like summary judgment play, plays in our everyday lives. So I could be convinced that we need to change the system, um, but it's a much larger issue than just a, a, a single sentence, right? It's a single phrase. And so uh, we suddenly have to really as students, right? We have to learn how close reading is going to inform our decision on whether we support this idea or don't. And so, any claim that says that something's a violation or not of constitutional rights, it's going to raise these big questions and it's going to beg us for more context. So for example, we should think about, well, who should decide whether something is constitutional and what is not, right? So I do agree with the person that, you know, or the, the, or the theorists that say that um, something like summary judgment should probably be more widely discussed 
and thought about among the people and we should decide whether this is a process we really want. It probably shouldn't be left to just a handful of judges to make this decision, uh, especially as we've had more and more people participate in the system over hundreds of years. Uh, the second thing is, on the other hand, right, how can we have a system that's going to provide fair and equitable treatment to people um, given that people can bring cases that don't have any evidence, right? So how are we going to deal with those cases? If, if we don't want the courts to decide, then we're going to have to decide. And so we're going to have to come to some agreement about what to do with those cases as well. So it's not as simple as just dismissing it out of hand. Um, and then this leads to this other question of, you know, when we ask a question, when we say something is not constitutional, people tend to talk about like one sentence from the constitution, which has got a lot of parts to it. Uh, why, how do we justify ignoring other parts of the Constitution and only paying to some part of it? Shouldn't we be looking at the whole document and shouldn't we be thinking about the context? And I mean, shouldn't there be other issues as opposed to just, I think this says this and therefore I decide this, right? I mean, I, that this doesn't seem right to me that, you know, it's like you're taking something out of context and arguing it for something that you want, but you're not really considering other points of view. And so that kind of goes back to this uh, idea of having a dialogue with multiple points of view. So this has just been a very simple, quick, um, although very legally complicated, but very quick uh, way of showing you why context matters and just, you know, again, going back to this, um, not so much now what I think you know, but what I'm teaching you to think about is to develop a larger context outside of a reading, which means that in your note-taking process, you want to really think beyond just the main point of a reading. Uh, and really start to get into the larger context. How does it speak to the issues in the class? How does it speak to other uh, readings? Um, what do they have in common? What's different about them? And then, you know, what, what does that have to do with your daily life? And how does that kind of go along with the stories that you've told and that you've, you've kind of experienced in your life as valuable information?